Hello, everybody. My name is Tobacco, and thank you for joining today. So I am going to go ahead and share the screen and start the presentation. Is that cool, Melinda? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Okie doke. Share screen. Can you see this okay, Melinda? Yep. Okay, perfect. So how can I make, oh, I was gonna ask, how can I make this box smaller? Oh, um, with the speakers in it? Yes, this right here. Oh, can I, oh, I see that. There you go. Did I so, do okay. it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Got it. Cool. All right. Well, again, welcome. And then thanks for having me today. And um, today we're gonna talk about K&A Pumpwork. All right, let's get started. Quick introduction. Um, my name is Sugako Sugar Sasaki. And yes, Sugar is my middle name. And yes, this is true. And um, um, when I was a teacher, um, when I used, I was used to be uh, the preschool teacher and a student used to call me the teacher Sugar. And it was the cutest thing ever. Um, I'm just gonna close this one out. All right, so. Enough about myself. Let's talk about Can I Parkour because I only have a one hour with you. Okay, now, so let's talk about agenda. So today's agenda, number one, we're gonna talk about benefit of a Can I Parkour. And number two, we're gonna talk about safety. The safety is a must topic to talk about because you are not going to work with the trainer side by side so you will be responsible for, you know, maintain the safety of your dog, yourself, and the others, because that bill is very expensive and lawsuit is very expensive, right? In case, if your dog hurts someone, especially a kid or a cause in trouble and lawsuit could have very much could happen. So safety is a must topic. Um, and the next topic, next thing that we're going to talk about is pre-required skill for parkour. Um, we're going to do two skills that we're going to talk about. Um, then the next agenda is the fun part. We're going to look at how to teach this parkour moves. Um, I have a demo videos with uh, for you so that we can watch it all together. And the last one is Q&A time. If you have a question, I will answer your question. All right, let's get started. Oops, okay, no. So k parkour is of an agility and anywhere can be your agility classroom, okay? The benefit of k parkour is it is a social and physical enrichment activity. So social enrichment is any positive interaction with people and a dog or dog to dog or dog to another species like a dog and cat. Physical enrichment activity is exercise. So parkour is great because this is a teamwork activity. So um, we can get both. The dog can get both social and physical enrichment through the parkour. Um, also, this is um, great great um, physical and physical activity for a dog who has, uh, you know, the behavior issues such as least reactivity, um, fearful or anxiety um, challenges, um, or any dog that are not good for group, uh, group class setting because it over, you know, arouses them or over excites them. And the another benefit is it will help boost up the self-confidence. And um, this is a huge one. The, it will also help improve um, space and the body awareness in dogs, especially among large breed, because um, the large breed dog, their, do their body grow rapidly, very, very rapidly. Um, they started with a little tiny potato and the next thing you know, um, their body is big. Um, bigger than maybe my weight. Um, so the, some of my clients is, some of my clients weigh more than me. Um, so 
because their body grows very quickly, they literally sometimes they don't know how big their body is, how long their legs are, um, where their butts are. So this activity, physical um, canine fitness activity will help their help to improve their spatial awareness and body awareness. Um, also, lastly, this can also use as a part of training. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear, canine parkour is not the solution for a behavior modification plan. It can be used as one of the tools. Okay. All right. Next. Close this one up. Whoop. All right. So I said, um, I said that one of the benefits is behavior modification. You can use it, parkour, you can use parkour as part of a modification plan. How exactly can it be useful? Well, it can teach a dog to manage arousal level. Um, also, it will help to change the dog's perspective of the environment um, because we are going to create activity map um, that is repetitive and predictable, almost like a walk routine. So um, it will create less anticipatory anxiety in dogs. And um, we're not going to talk a lot about this today, but maybe this is another topic that we can talk about, Melinda. Wink, wink. Um, all right. So I'm going to show you the uh, activity max sample. So this is the activity max sample that you can use. Um, so the parkour is um, arousing activity, any activity uh, that um, elevate the heart, you know, the dog heart rate um, is considered as arousing activity. So right after that, we have we en have a dog engaged in a quiet activity. So they can uh, quiet activity involve uh, uh, the example of the quiet activity might be sniffing or scattering feed or just watching the world go by. Um, any activity that helps them to decrease the heart rate. So by combining those two as a one part, a one pattern, the dog is engaged in practicing, you know, managing on the arousing activity, arousing level. Okay. All right. Now we talked about the benefit of a canine parkour. Now we're going to talk about safety. So people often ask me about equipment, the harness. So the harness that I love to use for canine parkour is what I call Y-shaped harness. So the Y-shaped harness has chest pads and double clip, and also had a handle or just in case. Um, and then the great thing is it has a less or no restriction around the shoulder brace. So that way they can have, they can move their shoulder freely. We have a yoga pants for yoga for a reason. You cannot stretch your leg with tight skinny jeans. So um, you want to have, you want to have uh, the, the harness with less or no restriction around the shoulder brace for exercise like can I park one. Um, the chest pad, I like, um, I prefer having a chest pad because just in case the dog hits their chest on the object when they're jumping on or jumping off. There is something on the chest, so that will decrease the impact. Okay. And the handle, um, again, this can use as uh, spotting, which we're going to talk about later. Um, or, you know, emergency, sometimes we have to grab. Uh, or catch a dog when the dog is losing the balance. So the handle is very, very, very useful for that occasion. Okay. So um, these harness is a great, okay too. This one harness with no chest pad, that's fine. I have one of those too. This is very easy to put it on my dog. So I often use this. And a training harness. Um, so this is a freedom harness. It's good too, good one too. Um, especially when you work with a dog with um, behavior issues like leash pulling, 
um, or this reactivity. This is the one I often use. The harness, um, freedom harness with a double connection leash, which I'm gonna show you later on. Um, okay, so when you pick the training harness, again, the same principle, pick the one as um, less restriction on the shoulder bridge. Just like I said earlier, yoga pants principle. You don't want to have a too tight clothes or too tight pants when you're doing the yoga. Same thing. You don't want your dog to do the jumping or you know do another activity with um, the harness that restricts their movement on the shoulder. Okay, so let's talk about not so ideal harness for pain and talk bar. So I call this side T harness. As you can see, this will greatly restrict the movement of a shoulder brace. This is, by the way, this is a great training harness. This is a, one of the non pool harness, um, but it's not ideal for canine top one. And another not ideal can, um, equipment for parkour is head halter. If your dog is wearing this, but you're thinking about can I park or don't do it. The um, hit halter can break, you know, can do um, the damage on the next uh, dog's neck and it could cause chronic neck pain, chronic headache. It can also cause, um, you know, aggression in dogs and not to mention that though is expensive. So if your dog is, if your dog has um, the behavioral issues that and then you're using a help halter and it do this instead. So the harness, um, we talked about that the freedom harness, this is a wonderful, um, or buffalo wear harness. This one has a chest, chest pad and a double clip, okay? So these two are my favorite um, training harness and you can also use for canine pop one. Um, if you don't have freedom harness or buffalo wear, get the one with uh, the double, the harness with the double connection, one in the front and then one in the back. Okay. And let's talk about the leash right here. This is what the double connection leash will look like. Um, this is about six or uh, six, or eight feet long. And if you have a longer, uh, if you have a large breed, extra large dog, or want to make a longer leash, use this double connection thing, uh, double connection uh, the connector that actually designed for connecting it to dogs at one time. Um, and then use this end of the leash and it connected this end to make it longer. Okay. All right. Oh, by the way, um, I forgot to mention. So the, the reason why I wanted to really wanted to use the double connection leash is that it will help to distribute the force into two directions. So it will really help you to manage the dog easier and um, easier and quicker. Okay, let's talk about spotting. Spotting is a technique that we use to reduce the physical impact on the dog when a dog is um, land on the object, jump on or jump off the object. It will help to lower the risk of a paw, back, and legs, joint injuries. So let's look at this to picture right here. So this is a Scarlett Jensen, and she is, um, this is, Scarlet's a double actress. And this is a canon parkour champion, ninja from Germany. And then this is a regular dog model, water collie. Highly trained athlete and normal dog. <laughs> actress, highly trained stunt actress. So what I'm trying to say is that just because your dog is, just because your dog is a dog, it does not mean your dog know how to use their body safely to land from the high object or jump on the high 
jump on the high object from the ground because your dog is not a trained athlete. He is, but majority of a dog is not. Um, Scarlett Johnson and her son actress, they're same human, same, you know, gender, same. Um, can she jump, jump off from the two straight building? She can. Um, can she land safely? Probably not because she's not trained stunt actress, but she can do it. Her stunt actress can do it because she is trained and uh, she's trained for this, right? So that's why I wanted to, um, again, emphasize the importance of spotting. And a lot of people ask, a lot of people said, oh, my dog can jump on the object easily. Oh, my dog can jump off from, you know, the higher, um, higher ground. I'm sure he can. I'm sure she can. But can they can they use their body in the safe way that you know don't that don't make them injure themselves? We don't know. Well, the dog doesn't know probably because we didn't train them to do so. Okay. All right. Let's look at this. Oh my goodness, this is the cutest thing you ever seen today, or what? This is a, um, the x-ray of a puppy bone. Look at how cute it is. Okay, so when you have, when you were thinking to do popcorn with your puppy, I want you to think of this textures. As you can see, the puppy's joint are, puppy joint and a muscle are not connected to each other. Um, it's just connected by the muscle, ligament, tendons. Okay, so their body, their bones is not fully connected like this in the socket, like this, until um, 13 or 18 months of age, depending on the size of a dog. Okay, which means you do not want to have a puppy jump from, jump on or off from the object, which is higher than their shoulder height. All right, okie do. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so now we are going to look at how you can do the spotting. Spotting is like catching a dog in the air with a leash. Um, so you will see that in the video that you can you uh, you will gonna move your arm up and down as the dog jump on or off. Okay, so the dog should jump on or off. I mean the height of the object should be more, no more than dog's shoulder height. All right, so let's watch the video. Apple, wait. Spotting. Yes. And you're gonna see the spotting with the harness. Great. So the first one, um, I the white dog is my own dog, and then we've been playing, uh, not playing, we've been dealing with the parkour for a year now, a year more than a year now. So we have a routine, and I know I'm very comfortable with the spotting technique, and also he is familiar with this object, although it was way high, uh, way higher than the shoulder height, um, but. If you are doing this for the first time, I want you to I want you to remember the height of an object should be no more than shoulder height. Okay, okay, all right. So I want um, again, I want you to do this. The spotting, um, I want you to be like a spotting to be your good habit. Um, every time your dog is up and down object. Okay, let's talk about the leash toys for canine parkour. Um, here's our ideal leash, flat leash, um, six to eight feet, and a short leash. Um, there are several different kinds. The shortest, shortest one is 10 feet, 10 inches, and the longest was 24. Maybe there are some longer ones available, um, but 24 was the one I was able to find. Um, so you can use a shorter leash in off-leash setting. 
such as um, your backyard um, or classroom setting. And a flat leash is great because it's easier to make it pile and it'll hold on to your hands. I put the rope type here in the middle because um, for me, it, it requires a lot of work because my hands are small. But if, you're, if you have bigger hands, if you're comfortable holding um, the, the rope type of leash, use it. That's all good. Uh, so let's talk about not ideal leash choice. It's going to be a re retractable leash. Um, you can't control that much. So not ideal. And then long line leash, 10 feet up. It's just too much work. So um, you can use it, but again, too much work. So I prefer flat leash. Okay. All right. Let's talk about pre-required skills for parkour. Um, so I want you guys to teach your dog the verbal marker, yes. You can, of course, you, um, you can use the clicker too, but your hands, it's gonna be very busy. Um, as you saw in the video earlier, the spotting, you have to use, um, you have to use the whole hands, both hands to, you know, do the spotting. And also you're gonna have to use your hands to give a dog a, a visual cue or gesture cue. So I, um, Clicker is okay, but verbal marker is much easier to use. All right, so I want you to teach your dog the word yes. Yes means she's falling out of sky. I want them to get the picture of a cheese falling out of the sky when they hear the word yes. All right, um, so the next step is, next, uh, not next step, next skill that I want you to teach your dog is hand target. Um, we're going to use this heavily in the later video, but I want them to know touching a hand with their nose means mom and dad's going to say yes, therefore, she's floating out of the sky. All right. Okay. So in this video, I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to show you how to teach, how to increase the uh, criteria after teaching a hand target. And also how I use the follow finger skill to um, manage the dog's movement and the speed of a movement. All right, let's watch. So one touch and cheese. Two touch and cheese. Increase the criteria. Grizzly is so adorable. Follow finger. It's a smaller um, visual target, so I use, I go back to the easier um, criteria, one touch and cheese. And then now he's getting better at it, so I'm increasing uh, criteria, two touches and cheese. Good boy. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. So now I'm going to use the following finger skills to changing direction. And control the dog's movement and this movement of speed. Yes, good boy, Grizzly. So I want you to have this skill done um, before teaching the parkour. All right. Oops, I wasn't ready. Okay, so let's teach parkour. And the first movement that I want to teach, uh, want to work on, is place paws on the object. There are two ways to do it. One is four paws on the object. Another one is two paws on the object. So when, um, so jumping on the object, and then the second one is placing two paws on the limb of the object. Okay, so for these, the way, uh, the how you use your hands is the key. So um, the video that I'm going to show you um, will uh, will will tell you how I use it. But let's watch. So more room, and then the Walter doesn't you know can't keep the speed up, and it will more likely jump. Um. 
So my finger was a, a act as a visual block and Walter slowed down and more like that prompted him to place on front pause. Okay, so let's watch it. I, actually, I'll just watch it one more time. Whoops. More room, Walter can keep the speed, jump up, touch it. Sugako cheese. <laughs> My finger move, um, work as a visual block. He slowed down and placed the pulse to uh, front pause. Okay, so use this two technique when you're teaching um, placing a full pause and two pause. All right. Okay. So the next, Oops. we're going to work on holding the position. This is a very, very important skill um, because I don't want a dog to jump on and off the object immediately before we, we were able to assist them landing safely. Remember, when the dog is on the object, we want to do the spotting right off the bat to prevent the injury, okay? So we want to teach a dog to hold the position on the object. All right, so let's watch this. And then this video, you will see me using counting as a vis uh, verbal prompt. And you will also see me how to fade out the prompt very systematically, okay? Oh, that's my clock. All right, there we go. I'm prompting him to be on, on the platform. Cake is on the platform for five seconds. And I give him a treat for his positioning for five seconds. The next time I will skip number five so that he has to hold this position for one second. And the next time it's holding two seconds. Another one is holding for sure for three seconds. Another one for a second hold. And this is a have I no outcome. He is he held the position for five seconds without the prompt. All right. So this is how you can um, use how you can add the prompt which is counting and how to fade the prompt so that dog can engage in the learned behavior independently. All right, let's move on to the next. All right, so the next skill that we are going to teach is called under. So we're gonna teach a dog to go underneath the object and to get a treat. Um, for this first step, we need to create a secondary reinforcer zone. In other words, we need to give a dog a good reason to go underneath the object and then go to the other side. Because for a dog, it doesn't even make sense to go under the object. They can go around. They, it, you know, this requires a lot of work. So they're like, it doesn't make sense. I can just go around or jump over. Why do I need to go up there? So, we need to first, first step is we need to give them a good reason to go underneath, um, underneath the object. And at, uh, in the video, you will see me tossing a treat. And then when a dog is eating and I position myself, kind of, I position myself where they can see when they turn around. So when they stop, when they're about to finish eating, that's when I call their name to make their ear ready. And I sit under, um, so pleasant to test. And if they go, if they go under the object and it came back to me, that's when I give a treat. 
Okay, that's the first step. The next step is we're gonna use the hand as a visual target to prompt, um, prompt the behavior of going under. Okay, all right, let's watch. Tossing the treat, secondary reinforcing zone. Okay, yeah. okay, and I said yes, and I give a treat. Tossing a treat. Yes, we're coming back by going underneath. Okay, this one, um, the second step, you will see me using the hands as the, the visual, visual prompt. And then the dog will come underneath the object to touch my hands to get a treat. Because they know touching your hands means she's running on the sky. <laughs> Hank. Hank. Yes, good boy. All right. So, first step create the secondary reinforcers and give them a good reason why they need to go under the object, go to the behind, go to the other side, and practice this going underneath. Okay. The second step is. Um, Face the treat tossing, and instead you're gonna use a hand to prompt the dog to go, um, go under the object to get a treat. All right. Oops. Next one is a balance walk. Balance walk is where a dog is walk on the object that is higher than the ground. Okay. So you will see two steps. Uh, yes, two steps for this. I, I need to think of, thought about something. Two steps for this. One is, um, the first step is create a treat delivery system. We need to give them, we need to uh, teach them the verbal cue and what action follows it and what happens after. So verbal cue, action, and treat. Okay, so my verbal cue is walk. So after I say walk, and, uh, and then I'll step, I'll make two or three steps. One, two. And I'll say yes for following, you know, making those steps. And I give them a treat. Give my dog a treat. And I said, walk, two steps. Yes, give a treat. Walk, two steps. Yes, and I give a treat. That is the first step. And after that, you can gradually increase the number of steps in between the verbal cue, walk, and a treat. Okay? And the next step is, again, use hand as a visual prompt because they know touching a hand with the nose means she's pointing at a sky. So they're more likely to look and follow your hand, okay? Um, so this is great when a dog is about to lose you know, focus um, or distracted by something something like a jogger or a squirrel or, you know, the loud noise from outside. You can simply place your hands and remind them that, hey, touching hands means she's going to fall out of sky, so let's get moving, okay? And after the second step, um, treat is always at the end of the walk instead of during the walk because I want them to complete the balanced walk first to get the treat. All right, um, let's watch. Step one, verbal cue, action. Walk, one, two, yes. Good, <laughs> visual prompt. I use a hand visual to prompt her to walk and complete the task. And if this is Apple, um, I have to speed up because she walks very, very slow. So after all the walk, spotting, and then I give a treat at the end. All right. Next step. This is one of my favorite skills to teach, going around the object. So this may be a little, um, little tricky for some folks, but we can, 
I'm going to divide it and then make a smaller step so that we can all um, practice this together. OK, so we talked about secondary reinforcers zone, giving a good reason for a dog to go to the designated spot. So once again, it, you know, it doesn't make sense for a dog to go around the object to get a treat. If I'm standing right there, you know, why do I need to go around, right? So that's why we need to give them, hey, if you go around the object, you can get a treat. If you go to the sides of the object, you can get a treat. So the first step is always creating the secondary reinforcer zone, okay? All right, so um, this is how it goes. So this is a starting line. And when a dog is at the nine o'clock spot, you say yes, and it drops at the 12 o'clock spot. And then when a dog is eating, you send another yes, and they drop a treat at the three o'clock spot. And a dog, when a dog is eating, you are going backwards by showing the hands as a visual target and then treat at the end. So what we were teaching is when we approach, you're gonna go around and you also get a treat at the end. So we are teaching this flow of a movement. And after you go this way, and you wanna also gonna go the other way because we wanna teach um, that going around this behavior um, in the both side. Okay, once again, approach the object, when a dog is at nine o'clock, you say yes, and then drop a treat at the 12 o'clock. And you said yes for another time. And then you drop at three o'clock and the handler will go, go backward by showing your hands. Use the hands as a visual prod for the dog to come back to you. And then treat at the end. Okay, so the next step is Fading the treat. So we're going to start fading a treat. Um, instead of giving it two times, we're going to give only one time. If we successfully created uh, the secondary reinforcer zone, which is behind the object, um, the dog will more likely to go around easier, much easier, much smoother. So once again, we approach to the object. And when a dog is at the nine o'clock spot, we'll say yes. And I drop the treat at three o'clock. And we're gonna go backward and showing hands as a visual target and prompt the dog to come back to you. And the treat at the end. And after that, we're gonna do a backward. So when a dog hit a dog approach at the three o'clock, you're gonna say yes and I drop a treat at the nine o'clock. And you're gonna go backward as showing your hands as a busy part. All right, the final step is we are completely remove the treat. They can only get a treat after going around an object and coming back to you, okay? So we approach and then when a dog is around at nine o'clock and it, this is when you give a hand signal. You can do around, you can do around, it, either, whatever is great. So um, I found, I, I be using this motion because it's kind of mimic the, the, uh, the behavior of dropping a treat. Like, so you will see me doing like this. And um, the puppy in the next video will go, oh, I remember Stacco has been dropping the trees. So I better go around and I get a treat. So recap, um, approach. And a, when a dog is at a nine o'clock, you sit around and give a hand cue. And then when a dog is at a 12 o'clock-ish, that's when you say yes. And going backward as you're show, as showing your hand as a visual target. So your dog will more likely go, oh yeah, touching your hands means she's falling out of sky. So I better get out of here. And after they can, they come back to you, that's when you give 
a tree. And after going this way, you go the other side. So when a dog, um, a dog is around at three o'clock, that's when you say yes, and it do this motion around and give, um, give a dog gesture from. And you will say yes when a dog is around the 12 o'clock and um, we go backward at showing your hands. And after your dog has come back, that's when you get the treat. All right, let's watch. Okay, so you will see a, a puppy named Aspen in this video. And she is, she was, younger than 18 weeks when I took this video. Um, so you will see her kind of wobbly, which is, uh, which is adorable, very, very adorable. Okay, let's watch. Second, the reinforces are in step one. Always give a good reason to go around the object. 12 o'clock, nine o'clock, Showing your hands. Aspen touch your hands and then she can get a tree. You think you get a tree? 12 o'clock, nine o'clock. And we're gonna start fading a treat. <laughs> Good girl. Yes, Aspen, good girl. Okay, this is the final stage. We're gonna add the verbal cue. Uh, yeah. Yes, Aspen, good girl. Uh, whoops, wobbly leg. This is the final outcome with hand. Yes, Hank. Yes, Hank. <laughs> this is a fun trick to teach. All right. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Oh, this is one of my favorite tic tac, very popcorn like um, movement. So, what tic tac is, we can. Um, Dog will jump on the object like a wall or a tree, jump on and it kick the object and lands on the uh, on the ground. So the dog will go do do movement. Um, so I'm gonna show you two ways to teach. One is um, we're gonna use a, a agility equipment called jump and also a wooden board. Um, the another one is um, I use the outside object. Um, which is a huge rock. Um, so let's watch. The first thing, first step with the jump is we're gonna teach the flow of a movement. I'm using a hand target and at least you have to jump in behavior or over behavior and immediately give them a second hand target so that the dog will go over and land through this motion. Toon, toon. Okay, all right. Let's watch. So gradually increase the angle. Yes. He's looking at my hands and I'm looking at my hands to land. Oh, Hank is so good. And this, um, I'm using an outside object, huge rock. I'm using Roma to, to do the tic tac. I use the hand to show what the movement is or flow. And she's getting good at it. And the next step is adding a speed. Oh, yes, Roma. All righty. So TikTok is super fun activity you can do at home or outside. Okay. So you can be creative by combining the movements with the same object or multiple different objects. So this is an example of um, how you can combine multiple skills with one object. 
And the second one, it will show you the multiple uh, scales with the multiple with different objects. Yes, multiple skills and objects. Good job, fire pit as a balance walk and two feet on a chair and a full feet on a chair. Great. So like I said, you can be creative and come up with a routine, proper routine. And it's, it is, um, you can be creative and then put it in the way that works your dogs, works your dogs and it works you, work with you. Okay, so where can I do parkour? Well, anywhere, pretty much. Of course, within a reasonable expectation. Um, avoid any places that could cause accident injury um, because you don't want to, you don't want to cause you don't want to cause injury. You don't want to cause any problems. Um, so I usually avoid the roads, uh, uh, area that is close to the roads, busy road, the big roads, too much traffic. Um, playground. So playground is designed for children. When the children are playing, don't use it. So I recently learned some states or country um, playground, the, the dog is not allowed in the playground. So the playground I use is in, it's in my neighborhood. So um, always check the area. Um, if the dog is allowed to be in the playground, um, so, so that we can avoid any conflict. Okay, so obviously avoid a private property and places with a broken material or construction site. Um, yeah, use your common sense. I trust your judgment. Um, all right, I want you to be safe and I want you to enjoy popcorn with your dog. Okay, so if you are in love with the fan and popcorn, I highly recommend to check out the website called International Dog Popcorn Association. They have a such a wonderful informative webinars, workshops, and you can also get a popcorn title. Training titles available for 18 months and younger. Um, and also great, it's great for senior dogs and novice title, immediate speciality and the championship and expert title. All right. Oops. And thank you. This is the end of presentation. And it, these are my demo dogs. And I really want to say thank you for um, the owners to let me use their videos and let me work with them and without them um this presentation was not possible okay it's a question time so awesome. i am yes i'm gonna stop sharing the um uh, just sharing stop sharing right sure okay i'm just gonna all right we have some questions for you and if you have more questions please put them in the chat so the first one says I was a little unsure about the counting. I think this was earlier on. Can you explain more about the counting, the one, two, three, four, five? The counting is used for um, practicing holding a person for a longer duration of time. So you can use um, counting is easy. And, but if your dog has a great skill, but stay skill, you can use stay instead. Awesome. Someone asked, do you have tips for getting your dog to watch where they're walking for the balance walk versus just looking at your hand for a treat? Our dog tends to watch the hand and he's more likely to trip or stumble on his own feet. <laughs> I see. So um, if you, are you using a food luring? You have a food between your finger or are you just using a only hand? Faith, we'll, we'll wait for you to update that in the chat see if Faith is still in there. Um, I'll go into the next one briefly. Okay. When you were shaping with Aspen, did mm -hmm. you do each step only once in each direction before you added the verbal cue or is that just the only part you showed us in the video? The shaping um, I did it multiple times. So at least five times, but Aspen was very, very quick learner. She was wonderful. So she excelled very fast. 
but usually I do five or six times in between. Yes. Awesome. Before moving on to the next step. That's what I cool. mean. And Faith says they've done both with uh, treat lore and just using a touch. Yes. So I will eliminate the treat lore because your dog is food motivated. Um, I want them to have clearly clumsy. Is he a big dog? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a big clumsy dog who sometimes yes. follows the treat but doesn't watch his own feet. Yes. So that tells me that he doesn't have a um, good sense of space and body awareness. So you might want to work on, before working on a balanced walk, you might want to do this two, um, two paws on the feet at platform or full paws on the platform. It really, you know, helps him improve their awareness. And then once you get that, and then um, you can, you know, you can refine the skill of a hand target. I will eliminate, I, I won't use the, the treat, the treat luring for this case because he loves treats and he will probably all be, all, you know, crazy about the treat. Or maybe you are using too high value treats. So you can start using the lower value treats. If you're using a cheese that makes him go, oh, just him up, um, you might want to um, downgrade the treats, like maybe a kibble or maybe a carrot or something like that. He bubbled like it. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> some, some dogs just are a little more clumsy naturally. So that, yeah. that makes some sense it happens. But I think those are some great tips. Unless anybody has more questions to put in the chat. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. A couple of quick reminders. I'll get the recording up hopefully by tomorrow afternoon and I'll send out the link to everyone. If you're in a position to donate, we would greatly appreciate that. That's how we make things like this happen. We also have things like t-shirts on our website if you would like one. Um, our next webinar is coming up in about a week. We have um, a webinar coming up about trauma in the animal care world. We have uh, oh gosh, walks with your teenage dog is coming up. We've got a whole bunch of fun stuff. So if you haven't checked them out, check out our next round of webinars and we will see you next time. And thank you so much, Sugako, for this. Thank really you. Okay. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.